simply because it wasn't planned for. It wasn't anticipated, and no effort was made to prepare, take the longer term view of the educational process. Well, I, I think a lot of people in this room would agree that we have some problems with education that need to be addressed. I don't think we really have time here at this session to get into the nuances of uh, immigration that depart from foreign policy. And certainly if we made this a forum on education, we'd be here all day. I think we uh, that probably deserves a, a forum in its own right. Uh, do we have any other audience questions? Yeah. So um, I know that one of the traditional pillars of traditional conservatism is foreign policy, the foreign policy box. They make up a concrete block of our party. Um, if, at the end of the day, the libertarian position on foreign policy wins out and it becomes the majority view within the Republican Party, where do you see the future of that block? I know in my personal life I've seen foreign policy blocks in the 2012 election turning and voting for President Obama because they felt he was a stronger hawk on foreign policy than Mitt Romney. All right. Uh, Robert, do you want to try that? Uh, I don't see... Uh, I guess autism in the uh, neoconservative sense is one of the, uh, the fusionist conservatives trying to make it that uh, it's like a three-legged stool, as I'm, I'm sure everybody's probably heard one time, or economic, you know, free market uh, conservatism, uh, you know, traditional values, and then you have national defense conservatism. They take national defense conservatism to mean they invade everyone all the time and neoconservatism. I don't, don't see that at all. I, I mean, I, as I said earlier, I, I'm for a more traditional uh, the sense of that the Republican Party up until probably the 60s was you know, a, a, a humble measured response to uh, foreign policy problems. And uh, I think we just we need to return back to that. I mean, the neoconservative is really a thing of the past 40 years or so, and then not traditionally Republican or conservative at all. Thanks. I agree with Robert, actually. What I feel is uh, this goes back to one of the points that I was trying to make earlier about um, how we apply theory to our foreign policy, that I feel that in many respects, conservatives used to be more, um, well, they used to be realists. You know, so when you think about Nixon, Henry Kissinger, and people that had great successes on foreign policy, even we didn't think they were the best Republicans domestically, um, their successes were largely based on, on a realist approach. And so for me, I feel like going back to that approach, um, ultimately, we would resemble more um, the traditional Republican we think of as strong on foreign policy. And in my opinion, a lot of our liberty candidates, with their supporting that non-interventionist uh, approach, would actually scale us back toward that uh, um, foreign policy approach that we were successful with as Republicans. In other words, I don't feel the theory necessarily takes us to an absolute, uh, uh, an absolute set of policies. I think it actually scales back our, our impulses to intervene in things that we shouldn't be intervening in. Yeah. Um, well, I, a aggressive foreign policy is not conservative. Um, the definition of the word conservative is to do things in a measured and responsible way. And anything where you are being as aggressive and, and outreaching as possible uh, is not going to be conservative. Um, and in the case of, of our foreign policy, what I look back to as, as a true conservative foreign policy is a foreign policy where um, you do the minimum necessary to protect your interests, but, but do those things very strongly. Um, uh, the, the peace through strength, Ronald Reagan's here, um, where the goal is to not intervene all over the place. But if you do have to do it, do it decisively. Uh, do it quickly, uh, get it done, and make sure that no one messes with you in that area ever again. Um, and that was the way Reagan tended to do things. He had no major long-term commitments overseas. Um, the longest commitment he ever had was in Lebanon for two years, and he later on said that that was the worst mistake he'd ever made in his life. Um, and the other ones were these little interventions like Granada, where you send a few troops in, you solve a problem, you protect the American citizens who are there, and you get the hell out. Um, that's the way that we should do things. Our, our army should be, to some extent, redesigned uh, to be a, a rapid deployment type military. Uh, to be able to respond to any crisis anywhere in the world uh, and be able to respond to it decisively. But the best thing is to have that power and not have to use it. Um, and to be wise and judicious in your decisions of how you use that kind of power. That's real strength, I think. Um, the person who's out there, you know, uh, strutting around, sh showing off how muscular he is and how strong he is, that's not real strength. It's the person who has silent strength, um, who's, who's willing to, you know, intervene when necessary and, and, and take action and do it effectively is much more important than the person who's always about how, how big and tough he is. Okay. Looks like we have time for about one or two more. Let's go ahead. Um, I, I also have a military background, so I sort of identify with some of the things you said. And having lived and uh, spent a great deal of time overseas, you start to develop a sense of what foreigners, how they see us. 
when we talk about foreign policy, I think one of the biggest problems during the Ron Paul campaign was his foreign policy was rewritten by the media as isolationism. And one thing we have to do, I think, is to at least get the word out about non-interventionism and how it is not the same. Because that was the same thing I got from a lot of Europeans, is they thought if the U.S. were to pull back troops and, and move out of Europe and, and withdraw from NATO, that, that was, they were going to become further isolationist. And I think we have to kind of define the differences. And I, I was just wondering if you guys had any ideas of how we could better do that. I feel that's a really valid point. I, I think that one of the things that I experienced living in the UK and in Egypt was that there, there's a great deal of misunderstanding about what we really believed as Americans about foreign policy and interventions abroad. And they didn't quite understand sometimes that the general consensus of the country didn't necessarily reflect the foreign policy of, of um, our elected officials. And I think that the biggest challenge that we face in, in what you're mentioning, using non-interventions, for example, as opposed to isolationists, um, it's one of the challenges that we, that we uh, face as libertarian Republicans, which is that we don't always have the most professional people running our campaigns. And there's some people that are, frankly, philosophically agnostic. And they're very good at running campaigns. They're very good at running candidates. Um, Lee Atwater, for example, uh, was somebody that, in reality, could have ended up working for a Democrat and probably could have won as many elections. And he was more passionate about running campaigns than he was about uh, um, any set of ideas and principles. Now, I'm not saying that's a good thing, um, but the reality is that we need to find people that know how to run campaigns. And I feel like we've been on the short end of the, we, we haven't really, <coughs> we have a ways to go, I think, in professionalizing and being more methodical um, in terms of how we campaign as libertarian Republicans. And I think that's, my, my opinion, I think that's a big part of it. The PR piece of it is missing. Uh, in many cases, and also too, I think we have to be cognizant of how we're perceived around the world. Because some people do respond domestically. People that are a little more educated um, will be sensitive to how they perceive people abroad um, might perceive our presidential candidates and the people we ultimately elect. I appreciate what you're saying. Yeah, I think it's important. Well, we want our military to be like ambassadors for America when they're overseas. We don't want our ambassadors to be the military. Uh, that's the, the sort of the problem we get into. If, if the main contact we have with other countries is our military, that's not giving them a really fair look at, at our country. Um, and it's not necessarily the most positive image we want to present. Uh, for example, in the case of, for example, Germany or, or Italy, say, um, we have a strong military presence in those countries. We have a lot of bases. We have bowling alleys and, and golf courses uh, and medical centers and all this stuff. But that doesn't define our relationship with those countries. Um, it's nice that we have those things, both for the, people, the native people in those countries and for our servicemen who are, who are stationed there. But what defines our relationship with those countries is our business relationships, um, our trading partnerships. And if we pulled out some of our military, if we got rid of those 19 golf courses in Italy, for example, um, well, that would put a few Italians out of work, uh, you know, working in the pro shop, um, or being caddies. Um, but it wouldn't change the fact that we have a very strong permanent relationship between Fiat and, and Chrysler here in the United States. It wouldn't change the fact that it's a major trading partner, a major tourist destination for America. Um, it's a major place for us to film movies and do all sorts of other things. Um, those relationships wouldn't change. And that's, our, you know, our relationships are much more multifaceted um, than just where we happen to have military bases. Um, and we should not fall into the trap of thinking that those military bases, if they went away, all of a sudden we would no longer really be involved with those countries anymore. Um, and some of them, of course, we're never going to get rid of. I, I firmly believe that we need to keep um, certain key military bases um, as a staging ground for important international obligations. If we ever get to a situation where we actually have to fight, we must have certain bases. Those can be done through host nation agreements, and they don't necessarily have to be occupational forces right. in those countries. Those should be agreements that we have that don't end up costing us billions of dollars to keep people over there. Uh, only actually, uh, from what I've seen, it, it's better in many ways for the local country, this is the case of the, the State Department, to hire local people. You, you, you make an agreement with a country like Kazakhstan, you put a lot of people to work who are Kazakhs, um, and they're a country that could really use the economic benefits, and have them working for the United States, uh, bringing their economy up. Exactly. Uh, I want to go back to what you said about the media sort of defining Ron Paul's coup on foreign policy. I think that uh, Rand Paul really has, uh, as I said earlier, his hit nail on the head. He can appear strong while still essentially uh, really not changing his uh, positions from his father's that much, just for more reasonable presenting them. 
And uh, you know, we don't have to completely withdraw, as Dave said, from every baseball ball. Like the, uh, the uh, military hospital in Montreal, Germany, that, that that's going to stay. I mean, that's where everybody gets sent from Afghanistan and everywhere else. Just we're have a really, really basic network of bases around the, around the world where we uh, have uh, good relationships with host nations. And, and you know, if people don't want us there, we, we shouldn't be there. You know, I don't want to have, that, have a base in Uzbekistan. We're really, really unpopular there. And uh, but as a movement, I think the important <coughs> thing is to uh, just to keep either the Democrats, the traditional Republicans, I don't know, we're the traditional Republicans, the neoconservatives, whatever you want to call it, and or the media from defining us. We need to define ourselves. We need to remain positive manner, And we need to sort of appear as part of the conventional wisdom and actually being part of the conventional wisdom. We just need to choose our language more carefully. I think that's the key. Okay, last question, and please make it a question. Um, well, it should be pointed out that <coughs> economically, it can actually be cheaper to keep a base overseas than to keep the equivalent base in this country. So, those foreign bases are not necessarily a net economic loss. They would, they would be, if we could cut down the entire operation everywhere, it would be. But if we have to have the operation, you know, many countries are very cheap to operate in. It costs less for supplies and, you know, all the things one needs to maintain a base. Uh, yeah, I can address that very quickly. Answer 